Okay, so in this chapter 1.4, I want to talk a little bit about element, elements of differential geometry, submersions and immersions. So um, mostly these uh, types of mappings are introduced because they allow us to understand better uh, and to con uh, sub manifolds of uh, manifolds and to construct um, sub manifolds. And let me give you an, first a definition of what I want to consider as, an, uh, as a submersion and immersion. And then we'll um, compare this to several finite dimensional notions you might have seen. Um, for the lecture, it will be more crucial to concentrate on submersions because they are, at least for what we want to be doing, uh, they are more useful um, in the constructions we want to be doing. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, what is a submersion in our setting? So the setting is as follows. We have um, two smooth manifolds, possibly modeled on uh, infinite dimensional spaces, and uh, we have a smooth map between them. And then we say that the phi, oh, the smooth map phi is an immersion. If for every x we have a manifold chart around this x and uh, the image point, such that on one hand um, we can split the model space as uh, a direct product of two locally convex spaces, so E times H. So E and H should be complemented. And um, the local uh, representative of phi in these charts is the inclusion. So let me, let me just uh, draw a nice little picture. Let's try to draw a picture here. Um, so basically you have your manifold M sitting here, then you have the phi, and uh, this goes over to N. And what you want, if you have a point here, you want a chart, let's say U. So um, this sits inside of the M. And uh, then you want to restrict your mapping phi here. You want to chart over here, let's say V. So let's give this, uh, let's call them phi and psi. Uh, let's call this guy here psi. And this one kappa. Uh, so this sits inside here, and then we use the charts of the psi here. Uh, so the psi is a chart of M, it's going over to the model space E, and the kappa is going over here. And uh, so the model space of, uh, of N is uh, space F, but uh, we require this to split uh, as topological vector spaces as E times H. Oops, sorry. Uh, this was a little bit not enough uh, space here, so this should be e times h. And we want that the arrow on the rightmost side, so uh, that this red arrow here, that this is just the inclusion of, uh, of vector spaces. And what this should mean is that um, locally in these charts, the um, um, the, uh, the mapping uh, is an immersion if we can find for every point locally charts such that the charts conjugated just to an inclusion of vector subspaces. So these charts are usually called then immersion charts. And uh, so we want that at every point we can trivialize the map in charts uh, to just an inclusion of a complemented uh, subvector space. So this will be the notion of an immersion. And uh, well, the dual notion in some way is, is a submersion. So uh, for a submersion, we want that um, for every point, there's a manifold chart around the point and the image point such that now we have the converse. So uh, we want to split the model space of our manifold M into uh, uh, a record of locally convex spaces of F times H. And in these charts, the local representative of our mapping should be a projection onto the factor. So um, as you might have seen in finite dimensions, so if, uh, to give you a finite dimension in intuition of what the immersion means, is uh, basically an immersion is a, is a nice way of uh, mapping um, a lower dimensional manifold M into a, la a higher dimensional manifold N. I mean, in infinite dimensions, we cannot really talk about uh, higher and lower dimensions. The dimension is always infinite. But um, so the idea is an from an immersion, you go from a manifold whose um, 
whose modeling space sits nicely as a, uh, as a complemented vector subspace inside of this larger space F. And for a submersion, it's, uh, it's the opposite. So you're starting at the manifold modeled on a larger or in finite dimensions, higher dimensional space. And you're projecting down onto a, uh, onto a manifold, which is modeled on uh, a direct summand of um, uh, original model space. So this is an immersion uh, and a submersion. And um, these speci special charts, I said already for the immersion, but for the submersion, the, the notion is the same. These speci speci sorry, special charts, which trivialize um, the mappings, are called immersion and submersion charts. So we are requiring these immersion and subversion charts. However, as you might, uh, if you've seen the notion in finite dimensions, you might recall that uh, there are some weaker, uh, some weaker versions of uh, of the uh, of the notion, or some uh, some different criteria which uh, guarantee to you that you have an immersion or a submersion. And let's, uh, let's, before we give some examples for immersions and submersions, they're coming, but let's um, take a look at these, uh, at these other conditions, which in finite dimensions are actually equivalent to this um, requirement that we have immersion charts or submersion charts for a given mapping. So um, the first one is the notion of being infinitesimally injective or infinitesimally surjective. And... Um, so we call a mapping infinitesimally injective if the tangent map we saw yesterday is injective for every x in your uh, domain of definition of the mapping. Uh, and well, infinitesimally surjective it's if, the, if these mappings are surjective everywhere. And in finite dimensions, what you can do with, um, uh, with mappings which are infinitesimally injective can basically use uh, the implicit function theorem for manifolds to show that there are immersion charts if uh, you have a mapping which is infinitesimally injective and if you have something which is infinitesimally surjective then you use the inverse function theorem to see uh, that um, this condition implies the existence of submersion charts. So in finite dimensions uh, these uh, conditions are uh, equivalent to being an immersion or, uh, in the surjective case, a submersion, respectively. Okay, then we have some other conditions. So um, we call uh, a mapping a naive immersion if for every x the tangent map is a topological embedding, meaning a homeomorphism onto a complemented subspace of um, uh, the uh, geometric tangent space at the image point. So what this means, uh, on one hand, being a naive immersion is um, uh, stronger than being infinitesimally injective because if it's a topological embedding, then uh, since we want a homeomorphism from TXM onto uh, the image of, uh, of this tangent map, uh, so this is automatically uh, requiring that the mapping is infinitesimally injective. So naive immersion is stronger than being infinitesimally injective. However, what uh, we require two more things. On one hand, uh, this should play nicely with the topology and also this uh, additional requirement that we have a complemented subspace in the image is something more. And again, in finite dimensions, these criteria are automatically satisfied if we have something which is infinitesimally injective. So also, this notion of naive immersion is the same in finite dimensions. So this is something one sees in the usual differential geometry courses. Okay, and then if we have a naive immersion, we use again the dual notion of a naive submersion. And this is... Um, the same, uh, well, this, this one looks a little bit asymmetric, but it's basically a, a similar um, condition to the one here with the topological embedding. So we say it's a naive immersion if the uh, tangent map at every point has a continuous linear right inverse, right? And um, so basically, this uh, continuous linear right inverse is... Um, on one hand, guaranteeing that the mapping is infinitesimally surjective, so naive immersion is stronger than being infinitesimally surjective. And um, you can show in finite dimensions that it's also automatically, or that this condition of being a naive submersion is satisfied if and only if um, 
the mapping is a submersion between finite dimensional manifolds. Okay. However, before we before we continue uh, now with with the investigation of these things, let us uh, switch again to the um, uh, to the writing, and let's let's just look at some examples of um, um, immersions and uh, submersions we have already seen uh, without knowing uh, in yesterday's lecture. So let's see. So let's uh, let's take a look at some examples. So yesterday, what we have uh, what we have done, we have um, constructed a uh, so if n sitting inside m is uh, seen, uh, or is a sorry is a submanifold. Um, I should say a split submanifold, then uh, the canonical inclusion from N into M is an immersion. Actually, it is much more, but um, we are only uh, considering immersions here and not uh, the stronger notion of an embedding. You can also define, if you know what an embedding is, there's also a corresponding notion of an embedding um, on uh, infinite dimensional spaces uh, or infinite dimensional manifolds, but uh, we don't care too much about um, uh, immersion, uh, sorry, about embeddings. Okay, so this is, yes. Question. Is it naive immersion also and infinitesimal? Yes. So I am. Yes. Um, I should. I should say the following. So we are. We are not going too much. Um, okay, let's, let, since we are. Since we are. Uh, since we are here. So what you can prove. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so um, the conditions are always related as follows. Um, so if you have an immersion, um, then this will always imply that it's na a naive immersion. And if you have an, a naive immersion, this will always imply that it's uh, infinitesimally injective. Sorry. Okay. In objective. And what you learn in uh, in finite dimensional um, differential geometry is the following arrow here if uh, the dimension of M is smaller than infinity, and uh, we have a mapping phi um, from M to N, which is infinitesimally injective. Then uh, this is automatically an immersion in the sense that there are these immersion charts. So um, we're not going too much into the details of uh, of this. I mean, there's you can basically spend a lot of time on, on doing this. There's um, uh, the proof is a little bit technical when you when you go from one notion to the other. So again, for submersions, it's just a bit similar. So we have submersion. This implies always that you have a naive submersion. This always implies that uh, it is infinitesimally um, 
search active. And again, well, if you have um, the dimension of your manifold M on which your phi is defined is finite, that's a, uh, wrong. Actually, the dimension of N needs to be smaller than infinity. And the phi is going from m to n um, plus the infinitesimally surjective. Then uh, it's a submersion, the strong sense of submersion charts existing. Um, so actually, uh, the conditions I've uh, noted now that the dimension of the source is finite uh, dimension uh, is finite dimensional uh, for the immersion condition. And the dimension of the target, so the dimension of n, is um, uh, is, fin uh, is finite dimension. This is already a little bit stronger than what you would expect from the finite dimension setting. I mean, in the finite dimension setting, all the proofs uh, are based on uh, uh, the assumption that both m and n are finite dimensional manifolds. However, you can actually strengthen these um, uh, these results a little bit. It turns out that whenever your source manifold is finite dimensional, then infinitesimally injective already implies the immersion property. And if your target manifold is uh, is uh, finite dimensional and the mapping is infinitesimally, infinitesimally surjective, then uh, you have the submersion in the strongest sense of the, of the conditions we we are considering here. And um, so, uh, well. It actually just for the submersion, it depends on the dimension of the target space, and uh, for the uh, and for the immersion, it's uh, the dimension of the source. However, uh, there's still another condition since we are since we are directly in the uh, discussion of of these things. So if uh, both M and N are Banach spaces, uh, sorry, nah, the wrong uh, wrong part of the diagram. So uh, what I want to say, so this naive immersion uh, is, so it's a standard result that if you have a naive immersion and M and N are Barnack manifolds, then the naive immersion property is the same as the immersion property, just by virtue of the um, uh, here of the implicit function theorem. And for the naive submersion property, it's the same. If we have M and N Barnack manifolds. So um, since I haven't officially defined what a Barnack manifold is, let's do this now. When I write Barnack manifold, I mean uh, an infinite dimensional manifold in the sense discussed yesterday, which, uh, whose model spaces are all Barnack spaces, right? So this is a Barnack manifold. And uh, in the Barnack setting, naive submersion implies submersion settings or having these submersion charts. Um, and uh, what you need for this is the inverse function theorem. Okay. And um, well, since um, those notions of uh, naive immersion and naive submersion are usually, or at least in, in the generalized setting we are considering, not as strong as the submersion property which requires having charts. Um, this should tell you that, um, well, or at least it's a hint, that for example, in on these generalized spaces we are considering, there are, uh, or there cannot be a, um, a suitable version of the inverse function theorem. I mean, otherwise, one if there was uh, an inverse function theorem which is suitable, you would expect that the Barnack uh, manifold proof, with uh, where you prove that the naive submersion property implies the submersion property, is actually also working in this generalized setting if there were an inverse function theorem. So um, this is already a hint. Um, that the implicit and the inverse function theorem are probably going to fail in our setting. Right. Mm. However, let's um, 
let's do uh, so we we had this uh, little example of, uh, of if for an for a, an immersion let's um, do another example for a submersion which is now quite cheap because we already computed it yesterday so if we have a manifold m uh, and um, in this case uh, from now on i'm usually co just considering smooth manifolds yesterday we were always uh, assuming that the differentiability class of the manifold is cr however i mean you can define all these notions of immersion submersion and so forth also for cr mappings uh, there are some technical details which are then happening if you have low regularity of the mappings meaning c1 or c2 and to avoid this in this section, we will always uh, assume that everything is smooth. So we have smooth manifolds, smooth mappings. So if we have a C infinity manifold, then we had yesterday constructed the tangent manifold. And uh, for this tangent manifold, we have the bundle projection. Phi, uh, phi m from Tm to m, which uh, if you have um, a geometric tangent vector sitting at uh, point P, so this is. Um, just uh, the base point projection okay and what we've seen yesterday that uh, using the canonical charts so t u phi we have this t phi and this goes to v phi times let's say e if the model space at this point uh, these points is e here we have the pi m this goes down to u phi just by definition of how the t u phi was defined yesterday here we have the v phi and down here the chart phi and what we computed yesterday is that the mapping here on the on the right hand side is just the projection onto um, the first component and now uh, we see so this guy here is an open subset of uh, the locally convex space e times e and this guy is the corresponding subset, uh, open subset in E. And um, right, so the canonical charts are just submersion charts for this uh, bundle projection. So uh, what this shows is that uh, pi m is a submersion in the strongest sense we have here. Okay. Um, right. So let me um, let me uh, just mention something. So it might be it might be a bit um, might be a bit dissatisfying. So we are not going to prove uh, all of these arrows in the diagrams we have here, right? So that immersion uh, implies naive immersion implies infinitesimal injective and uh, the converse and so forth. Um, however, there is a um, nice paper uh, or I mean you can find it on the archive and it's also mentioned in the lecture notes uh, so by Helge Glöckner which is called fundamentals of um, submersions and immersions between infinite dimensional manifolds. That's from 2016. And uh, so all of the all of the details I'm skipping here. So if you're really interested of why these equivalences or why these arrows here hold, they are all computed uh, with proofs in in this paper by Glöckner. Um, however, we'll uh, we'll skip a little bit the uh, the hassle of going through these proofs, which are sometimes quite technical and uh, require you to push around uh, a lot of these submersion charts and so forth. Um, so, what we are uh, all what I uh, what I want to do is I want to give you several examples of why, um, in general, in infinite dimensions, we only get uh, the uh, arrows in one way, but not the other. So um, let's let's have a look at at several examples. Um, 
because this also connects nicely to what we said yesterday. So 144 is the following statement that the infinitesimal notions are uh, weaker than the naive properties. And this is now a vector space, uh, a vector space um, example. Um, so we consider we are we're setting ourselves in the Banach space setting. And uh, so the Banach space are as following. Uh, so we take L infinity. Uh, I think most people have seen the L infinity space. So those are all the real sequences um, such that uh, the soup of the absolute values is bounded with this uh, with the soup norm with this gets a Barnard space. Then we have a subspace C0. Uh, those are all the Xn in, um, in the L infinity space such that uh, the limit of Xn is zero. And obviously this is a subspace. Um, um, okay. And so we can we can have a look at the following uh, diagram. So we can include the uh, small c naught space in L infinity. And then since it's a closed vector subspace, we can uh, quotient that out. So we get a quotient mapping here. And usually if, you, if you've seen category theory, what one uh, writes is we have such a sequence uh, and this is a so-called short exact sequence of uh, locally convex spaces. What this means is two uh, two things. So the kernel. Uh, so all of these mappings we have here are linear mappings, and um, the uh, kernel of uh, a linear map in the sequence is uh, the image of the previous linear map. This is what is called algebraically exact. And um, what you what we also want is topologically exact, which in this case um, exact, meaning that um, I and Q in the sequence are uh, not only continuous, but also open mappings. And at least for in this Barnard space setting, there's the um, uh, there's the open mapping theorem, which guarantees that. Um, if the sequence, uh, if the above sequence is a sequence of Banach spaces, which it is, then the open mapping theorem tells you that um, it's actually automatic. That uh, so from algebraically exact follows topologically exact in the Banach space setting. Okay, and this is again because of the general education. However, the whole point of this example is now so, um, and here, okay, there's a small cheat. Um, it is known that um, the space C0 is not complemented in L infinity. So what this means is um, we cannot write L infinity as um, C0 plus, uh, times uh, a vector, uh, another locally convex space H, such that this becomes uh, 
an isomorphism of locally convex spaces. Again, on the abstract vector space level, this works. However, this uh, C0 space is sort of the most prominent example, I would say, of a Banach space, of a subspace of the Banach space, which is not complemented in the larger space. Okay, however, um, okay, since this is not complemented, um, we basically see from the definition of what, what, is, a, uh, what is a naive uh, immersion, um, okay, so naive immersion requires that C0 is complemented. in L infinity. So what this shows is that the, the Yota is not a naive immersion. But if we take the derivative, since this is a continuous linear mapping, so the Yota uh, of x in the direction b, we know already that this is uh, the same as Yota of v, right? So we computed yesterday what the derivative of this linear mapping is. So this is um, the same by definition as this tx yota of v, right? So the tangent map at um, at a point is uh, just in this case because we are dealing with a with a vector subspace of a, of a Banach space. This is uh, so the tangent map is here at a point on the nose given by the derivative. And we see that the, since the mapping we are derivating is uh, a continuous linear map, we see that uh, the um, tangent map at x is just given by the mapping itself applied to the, to the vector we have here, to the v. And uh, so uh, since yota is, in, is injective, And this means that um, uh, the x yota is injective for all x, and uh, thus yota is infinitesimally injective. Similarly, q is infinitesimally surjective. Okay, and um, however, if uh, Q was a naive submersion, we would have a continuous linear inverse. Um, let's call this one H. This goes from L infinity mod C naught into L infinity. Um, so in other words, we would have um, that H composed with Q. Sorry, not this way. Of course, I made it exactly the wrong way around. This would mean that uh, if I apply Q to H, then I get the identity on an infinity mod C naught. And what I claim now is uh, that we can construct a, um, a complement of the space C naught if that was possible. And how do we do this? Well, um, so we have this. Uh, we have this. Um, uh, we have from this construction, okay, so note um, H is injective, and uh, we can construct a vector space complement uh, that's called capital H 
as the image of H. And what I claim is, um, let's say this is an exercise to check this. Um, we would then have that the small L infinity space is isomorphic as, uh, or as Barnack spaces, I should say, to C naught times H. Note uh, one thing which is which is immediately working out, since um, C naught is the kernel of um, our projection Q for algebraic reason. We have um, that L infinity is the same as C naught times H um, as vector spaces without topology. So all there is to do is to show that they are isomorphic as Barnack spaces, if that was true. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you have a look in this appendix A of the lecture notes, where there are characterizations of when something is complemented, you will find there um, a condition which um, is uh, saying it's complemented if there is a continuous projection onto uh, the subspace. And if you apply this criterion here, you will see that um, this continuous linear inverse H here uh, actually gives you such a projector. So this is the, the idea for the proof of uh, why this is true. However, since we know that uh, C naught is not complemented, uh, such an H cannot exist. So Q cannot be a naive submersion. Okay, already in Barnack spaces, the, na the naive submersion property thus uh, really is uh, properly strong. At least this example shows that if you have an uh, infinitesimally injective or surjective one, you cannot get the naive notions. Okay, um, and let's finally give, an, give another example um, that uh, naive submersions need not be submersions in the strong sense of admitting such charts. Okay, so the reason I want to give this, um, um, uh, this example is because it's very near to something we will be dealing with in the second chapter. So let's consider the space A of all continuous mappings from the reals to the reals continuous mappings from the reals to the reals uh, with the compact open topology. Um, so, uh, okay, so this, um, the compact open topology, um, okay, so this space becomes a locally convex space. And one can prove that it's even a Frechet space. Recall Frechet spaces were um, the ones which have a metrizable topology. Um, if you haven't reviewed the material on the compact open topology and uh, don't know right now what this um, uh, what this map uh, what this topology is and what its properties are, we will be reviewing this in the afternoon when we start with the second chapter because it's uh, basic. So at the moment, um, uh, you just have to believe me when. Um, when I claim some properties, we will see it in, the, uh, in one of the next lectures why this is actually true and how you prove it. Okay, so um, let's define a mapping of the following kind. 
So let's call it X A. So this should be a mapping from A uh, to A. And uh, what we do, we take a function F and send it to um, the composition E F, or in other words, this is just the exponential mapping, the usual one on the reals, composed with the F, right? So we are just uh, uh, post-composing mappings from the reals to the reals with the exponential mapping. And this is a continuous mapping uh, in the compact open topology, right? So this is, uh, this is a continuous mapping on, um, uh, on this infinite dimensional space. Okay, now let's, uh, another piece we need is that uh, the point evaluations um, from A, taking values in the reals and we take an F and send it to just the evaluation in, uh, in X of the F. So those are continuous linear on A. The question, uh, the question is basically, uh, so this is, linearity is clear because evaluation is just linear. Uh, the question is of course, um, how do we, um, uh, how do we see continuity? And again, we'll study this in the chapter on the compact open topology, right? So what we can do now, since they are continuous linear, uh, we use uh, the point evaluations to find a candidate for the derivative uh, of x a, because what happens, so we have seen this formula already. So if we have the composition of the derivative of the derivative of the composition is the same since um, the evaluation is continuous linear. I may move that out so it's the same as the evaluation in X of the derivative of the X A. Right? Um, okay. Thus, we obtain the following formula. So the X A, we want to derivate this at the point F in the direction of G, F and G are now functions, and we evaluate it at some point X. So what is it? It turns out, if you just write down what the differential quotient is and so forth, uh, so it's G of X multiplied with X a of f, uh, and then we evaluate at x. Okay, and um, so a small exercise, which you can't do at the moment because you possibly don't know what are the semi uh, what are the semi norms giving you the compact open topology. But once we discuss the compact open topology, um, we uh, we can work with the explicit semi-norms and then it's not too hard to prove the following. So um, having uh, signaled out a candidate for the derivative via pointwise derivation, one can show that um, the derivative on A really is given by the formula D X A of F in the direction of G is the same as G pointwise multiplied with exp A 
applied to f. So the, this uh, looks now a bit strange, but the uh, um, the upshot or what what you really have to prove is uh, so this above argument with uh, this equation star here is uh, now only after testing with uh, the point evaluations. And what you want to see is, I mean, this this gives you if um, the derivative exists. Uh, the point, uh, so it, the point evaluations tell you that the derivative has to be given by this formula star here, we have here. And um, however, um, after testing with the, with the point evaluations, you uh, only know what it must be if it exists, but you still don't know whether the differential quotient exists. So therefore, you need to do a calculation um, in the... Um, uh, in the semi-norm, so using the topology of uh, of the space. Um, okay, so if we believe for a moment that uh, this formula here really is the formula for the derivative, we can uh, now argue by induction that um, X A is smooth on A. So let me let me just outline the argument because it's quite quite nice. So we have now our, our red formula. Uh, so note that um, the red formula shows that um, D X A exists and is continuous by uh, continuity of the exp a, right? And um, so this, uh, this red formula is continuous in the compact open topology. Okay, what we learn from this is um, that exp a is indeed a Bastiani C1 map. Okay, but now we look at the red formula again. So what we see is um, the first derivative of the exp a is given by g times, and then we have exp a again applied to some argument. Uh, we now know from, uh, from our step in the induction that the exp a is already C1. Um, now, uh, this contribution here in green is also uh, con uh, actually this is smooth in G and also in, in the in the argument to the right hand side. So since um, the formula for uh, the X A is uh, given by a composition of uh, uh, smooth mappings, sorry, smooth mappings on A and the C1 map X A, we see that. Um, dxa is already c1. And if the derivative of a function is c1, this means that the xa is actually c2. And now we can basically play this game all the, uh, all the time we want. So this is like a bootstrapping argument. What we see now is, uh, again, turning back to the, uh, to the red formula, um, we see that the red formula always is given by um, a smooth part, which is the one I highlighted in green, and then a function which is increasingly more regular because we, we can sort of uh, pull up the regularity from this argument and increase it inductively. And the upshot of this is that uh, the x a is uh, smooth by a trivial induction.
So this is one, this is a thing which works very nicely in this Bastiani setting. If you have a good formula for the first derivative, in which you can sort of iteratively apply this argument that if uh, the formula uh, shows you that it's C1 and then the function is itself um, uh, again inside uh, of, the, of the formula, so then you get more and more regularity. So this is one of the standard tricks if you have a nice, well, if, you have a, if you have a mapping on an infinite dimensional space and want to show that it's uh, smooth in the Bastiani setting. Okay, uh, so we see that the XA is actually smooth. And um, so what happens if you insert the constant zero function? Um, then we get um, the exp a, so we are here at the constant zero function. Okay, so what does our red formula say about this? Well, it's just the second argument multiplied with exp a, and we have inserted the zero function. Exp a just does the following, so it takes the zero function and plugs it into the usual exponential function. So, a, uh, so e of zero is one. So what this is then, is this is the identity on our space A. So this is uh, what we get here. And uh, what, you, um, uh, what, you, uh, what you get from, from this whole construction um, is, uh, well, since I, I get now, I, well, I, I can uh, construct now a continuous linear right inverse, by, simply by uh, since simply since this one is always given by the identity, and uh, so what this shows is that x a is a naive submersion. Okay. However, the x a takes values in uh, the space of all continuous mappings, which take values in the open set from zero to infinity. Uh, and this uh, set does not contain a neighborhood of um, x a evaluated at the continue at the constant zero function. So this is the constant one function. Okay. Um, so I recommend. Well, I'm not going to explain why this does not contain an neighborhood. We will, or uh, well, you can return to this example and work out why this does not contain um, uh, a neighborhood of the of the constant one function. Um, uh, so return to this after we have discussed the compact open topology. One can one really needs to uh, to go back and see what are the open sets of the compact open topology and to, to see what is going on here. Um, so, however, the upshot of this is the X A cannot be an open map. Thus, it cannot be a submersion. since um, all submersions are automatically open maps in topological sense. So this is uh, this paper by Glöckner 
which was already cited in Slemma 1.7. So we are not going to prove this, but this is an example of why the naive subversion property on this fresh space is not sufficient. Recall from our, um, uh, from our nice little diagram, if all the spaces involved were Banach spaces, okay, so here, then, uh, or Banach manifolds, then the naive submersion property would imply the submersion property. If we are going beyond the, um, uh, beyond the, uh, beyond the uh, realm of Banach spaces to Frechet spaces in this case, then um, we don't get uh, that the naive submersion property is as strong as the submersion property. So I understand that the example is now a bit problematic since we haven't talked about the compact open topology yet. So the topological details will become clearer once uh, we have done this. However, what is very nice about this example, that's why I also wanted to show it right now, is um, this nice little argument of how you identify uh, that the XA is actually a smooth mapping in the Bastiani sense on this infinite dimensional space. Because this is a very typical argument for many mappings where you can, uh, where you can find a good formula for the derivative. You have, uh, we shall encounter this later on uh, again in the next chapters where you compute a formula for the first derivative and then can iteratively see that uh, the formula for the first derivative because it's given in some way by um, the function itself possibly composed with some other smooth functions this um, gives you a very nice um, a very, uh, very nice uh, formula which sh uh, shows that if the derivative exists so the function needs to be C1, then it automatically is C infinity. Okay, so this is it for this example. And now we are almost done with this section. The last thing which I want to do is uh, to remind you why one is usually interested in submersions. So um, the following definition should now also be uh, familiar if you have seen it in finite dimensions. So um, let F, from M to N be smooth and um, Q sitting inside of N uh, be a split submanifold. This is the only new thing, at least when compared to the finite dimensional setting. In the finite dimensional setting, all submanifolds are, as we've seen, split. Uh, so, but in the infinite dimensional setting, we have to require that it's split. Uh, then, F is called transversal uh, over this split submanifold Q if for each M in the pre image of the split submanifold and uh, for each uh, uh, for the submanifold chart. Recall we have a submanifold chart that's called psi, uh, which goes from some open set lead to V1 times V2 um, with the property that psi of the image point is the point zero zero. Uh, there exists an open neighborhood. U of M with the property that F maps this U into the into V. And um, we have that, so the following sequence of M, so from U, we take F, go to V. Then we take our submanifold chart and then we project it down to one component. So in this sequence of mappings in the script code 110, this should be a submersion. 
then we call the mapping transversal. Um, so in a way, um, what this means, probably instructive to, to look at some finite dimensional pictures, uh, what this means is that the image of, uh, of our mapping F meets the submanifold in a, in a nice way. So you can translate this in the, in the finite dimensional setting as, uh, as a property, um, uh, which has something to do with the tangent spaces. So what are the tangent spaces of F, the submanifold, compared to um, uh, what the image of the tangent mappings of F is? But in this case, uh, let's, let's not go to the infinitesimal description of, the, of, the transverse, uh, of this transversality condition. Let's, um, let, let me just give you the, 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 uh, the proposition, which tells you um, what... Um, or why we are interested in this R. And before we, uh, before we do this, um, let us note the following. If F is a submersion, then 1.10 is always a submersion since uh, psi and uh, PR1 are submersions and the composition of submersions is a submersion. And this is an exercise for, for this afternoon. It's one, seven, one. Right, so if F is a submersion, then we have uh, that this mapping is a submersion and these guys here are automatically submersions. And if we compose all three of them, then uh, we get a submersion. So this condition of transversality is automatic for, uh, a, sub uh, for a submersion. Okay. However, and here comes uh, the construction principle, which you probably also have seen in finite dimensions, and it's also true in infinite dimensions. So uh, let um, phi uh, from uh, m to n be Smooth and uh, S sitting inside of N a split submanifold of N, then uh, such that phi is transversal over S, then the pre-image of this S is a sub-manifold of M. So we can uh, pull back the, um, uh, we can pull back the, uh, the submanifold along this uh, uh, map, which is transversal, and uh, create a submanifold in the pre-image. And this is the premier use for, and we know one of this transversality condition, and then on the other hand, also the submersion uh, property, and why we want submersions. Okay, let me give you the proof which is basically the classical uh, uh, proof from finite dimensions. Uh, we just chose the right definition of transversality and or, or submersion, if you want, to get exactly what, uh, what we want here. Yeah. So, can, yes. can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So thanks to this proposition, we, are, uh, we can uh, extend even the notion of foliation of the manifold dam yes. into the level sets of the submersion. 
Yes, we could. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, foliations are a bit fickle. Uh, so since you mentioned foliation, you might uh, know the Frobenius theorem. And, um, uh, and this is an excursion. We are not doing uh, Frobenius theorems or foliations in, in the infinite dimensional setting. Um, however, there are versions of the Frobenius theorem also in this Bastiani calculus setting. Um, they usually have, I mean, you can't do usually without, uh, without a few additional technicalities. So you have to do, uh, to go something, I mean, you don't really have to work on Barnack manifolds, but usually at least for pieces of the foliation, a Barnack-like condition comes in because um, at least for Frobenius and a lot of what's done with the foliations, an inverse function theorem is invoked or a version of uh, such a thing. And uh, as I said, there, so there are, um, uh, one gets problems in this infinite dimensional setting, right? I mean, problems in, insofar as that there's no inverse function theorem in general. Okay, okay thanks. So, um, uh, by assumption, this uh, sequence of mappings 110 is a subversion. And uh, so, what we do is we shrink u and v1 such uh, that they are our charts. Um, it's called the charts phi from u to u1 times u2 and kappa from v1 to u1 such that uh, phi m is equal to zero zero. I mean, uh, sort of the, uh, we can always fix the, uh, the image of one of the, uh, of a point. Uh, by just shifting what this chart is doing. So this is really not that much of a requirement. So we, we want to fix um, what, the, what the image of the, of the phi is and what the, of the kappa. Um, right. Uh, and the following diagram commutes. Let me write down the diagram and let me then ask whether you've seen uh, commuting diagrams. So we have the sequence from 110, right? So u goes to uh, f via this, and we have the psi, we have the v1, we have the v2. We have the projection onto the first component, v1. And now we want uh, our charts. Uh, so here we have the phi going to u1 times u2. And here we have the U2, we have the kappa, and here the long arrow will begin projection onto the first component. Um, okay, let them, uh, in case you haven't seen commutative diagrams, what this means that the diagram commutes, basically uh, when you start in the upper left corner and follow the arrows down to the lower right corner, you get the same. Uh, you get this... Why you switch from u1 to u2 in the long row mm. and in kappa projections on the first? Yes, isn't it? Haven't I written both times projection onto the first? Or um... I mean, it should always be projections onto the first, right? If I'm not yeah, mistaken. but uh, why the projection on the first became u2? In the ah. right lower corner. Oh, oh, yes. Ah, sorry. No, this is <laughs> should be exactly. This should be u one, right? Then it also fits with the. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Both both times it should be u one exactly. I mean the kappa is also defined to go from v one to u one. Okay. Um, right. So the commutativity of the diagram means when you start in the lower uh, in the upper left corner and. Uh, um, go to the uh, lower right corner. It doesn't matter which way around the diagram you take; you get the same. Um, you get the same result. Okay. Uh, so let us now prove that uh, phi is a submanifold chart. For um, the inverse image of 
the S, right? Um, okay. This means what we want to see is that if we apply phi to u intersected with the inverse of image of s, then uh, this is the same as uh, we have phi of u intersected with u1 times 0, so with the subspace, right? Um, just by how we set this up. So we want to model it on, uh, on U1. Um, okay, uh, so to establish this. Note that uh, the Psi is a submanifold chart. For S, um, oh, and this means that um, if x is in u with the property that f maps this x into s, uh, this happens if and only if um, the projection on the first of psi of f of x, right? So psi is a... Um, uh, size is, uh, yeah, size is a submanifold chart, and uh, ah, no, I did I screw it up? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, yeah. probably I, uh, yes. Uh, um. Okay, right, sorry, this is a, uh, since this is a submanifold chart, what it, this should say, if I project it down onto the second component, then I get zero here. So psi, uh, psi of S, um, sorry, actually I should write psi of S intersected with, uh, the domain of psi with v, this is the same as psi of v intersected with v1 times zero. Okay, right. Uh, so this doesn't have anything in the second component. So what the commutativity of the diagram shows now Um, we have that this is if and only if, uh, uh, the case if and only if, so the phi of x is uh, contained in u1 times 0, right? And so uh, what we see is that this really gives you the phi is a submanifold chart. S phi of u intersect with f inverse of s is the same as phi of u intersected with uh, u1 times 0. Okay. And this was what we wanted to show. So we, we can construct at every point a sub-manifold chart and uh, we have uh, basically um, and uh, model this pre-image on uh, the split uh, subspace of the complement sub u1 times the zero here sitting inside of the model space of the one. So um, okay probably we should write something so uh, since uh, uh, m in f inverse of s was arbitrary. f inverse of s is a submanifold. Okay, and the corollary which is 
basically what we will be using most of the time. Uh, is uh, in finite dimensions also known as the regular value theorem. So if f from m to n is a submersion, then the inverse of uh, a point is a submanifold for each n in the target. Right. So this is uh, this just employs that if you have a if you have a point in a manifold, this is in a canonical way a zero-dimensional sub-manifold of um, your uh, ambient manifold. And if we have a submersion, uh, then we can just pull this back uh, using the that the submersion is transversal to uh, any given sub-manifold by the node we had before one four eight. And this gives us um, that um, we can pull back one, uh, one point, uh, uh, sub-manifolds consisting of just a single point under submersion to get uh, a sub-manifold of uh, the source of the um, submersion. Okay. Um, right. So this concludes our investigation of submersions and immersions. We will basically be interested to construct later on submersions uh, to construct sub-manifolds of infinite dimension manifolds. Uh, all of these proofs are basically versions of the finite dimension proofs. The um, only problem which arose in infinite dimensions was that we need to uh, take the right definition of an infinite dimensional manifold, uh, sorry, of an infinite dimensional submersion. And once we have, in this case, the strongest definition available, we can uh, just prove everything as in the finite dimension setting. Unfortunately, uh, the strongest definition is not um, equivalent anymore to the nice definitions we know.